diligently and fell asleep a quarter of the way through it. Uh, good morning all. Are you all fine? Nice to morning. see you all here. I know some of you are suffering from colds and flu and what have you, but there we are. OK, good. Uh, apologies for absence, please, Michelle. Hello, yes. Um, Councillor Phil Downing and Bridget Rowlands and Lyndon Jones will be here, but you'll be a little bit late. OK. OK, disclosures of personal and prejudicial interest. Members first. No. no. OK, then are there any officers on on the call that may have uh, personal and prejudicial interest? No, thanks. no. OK. Minutes of the previous meetings and responses to the panel's questions. Um, do you want me to go through these? No, OK. No. Um, we have no public questions. No. I'm assuming, Michelle, no. No, no public questions. Right, procurement inquiry findings report. Now, having discussed this, I think we need to have a narrative at the beginning of any uh, findings report that we put in, and that and that is the fact that we need to it describe what procurement is as opposed to buying something off a shelf. And I think we need to have that narrative to be able to say procurement is more than just purchasing something. Procurement is making sure what you're buying is fit for purpose, uh, regardless of a service or uh, an item. We also need to say that you know that we we should strive to buy correct first time and not go back a second time. And the other the other very important thing is that we're buying in a, um, a sustainable uh, way in which. We cover our uh, everything that we do is covered within the um, the acts that are, that are currently enacted with uh, currently in um, law within the Welsh government and the UK government. I think those are very essential that we put in front of the um, the narrative in front of any findings report we put in. I think. Part of also what we need to understand and what we need to say to council and we need to say to the cabinet is a great big thank you to um, the various people that have come along to give us evidence and actually give explanations of the roles and what procurement has meant to them. I mean, some of the, the private sector have come along, some of the officers that have come along. And a, a special thank you to to um, Chris Williams for making it relatively a very difficult prob, um, subject, relatively simple for us who who didn't know anything about it in the beginning. So I think those are the narratives that I would say we, we need to put it in the front. And I think uh, David also, with respect, David as can, as deputy leader, I think it's also that we make make it um, we make issue of the fact that. Procurement is a method by which this council has secured savings, but also has in, as in, as ensured that we get better service for what we spend. And I think that's a very important issue that we need to say. Um, Mike, you've got your hand up. Do you want to say anything? OK. Mike? No, well, Jeff Jones, Councillor Jeff Jones. Yeah, I think we need to make it uh, plain as well that um, uh, you know procurement. Uh, we actually entered into contractual ag agreements, actually, you know, on behalf of the uh, local authority, and to ensure really that uh, all the processes that are forward are lawful. Okay. Uh, anyone else, Mike? Mike, you're on mute. Yeah, I just want to endorse as I say, been, it's been it's been really really uh, encouraging to uh, be on this panel for procurement. As I say, uh, it's it's been very 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 um, um, good the way that we've uh, put things together, and as I say, it's been very detailed and comprehensive in our inquiry gathering. And as I say, I'm I'm, sh I'm sure that we're going to get benefits from the, the this, this panel. But uh, just want to endorse, as you said, about all the efforts that have been put in by the officers and 
uh, and, and obviously um, the, the, the people that, 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 that have attended the, the, the panel to give uh, evidence. So I think that's the narrative for the front end of the report. I think to go into detail, um, do, does any, uh, Chris, do you want to give any update on any of the details that we uh, we wish that you wish to put in? Because I noticed that when I read through the report, the one thing that struck me was social services um, and how difficult we are currently in a position with social services with a, definitely with our third party um, outside the voluntary sector and also with our providers in the care sectors. How difficult social services uh, procurement is going to be in the future. Um, and I'm not sure if you want to add anything. You know, when we when I read, read through the report, I know it's quite you know, it's only a few paragraphs, but I think it sends volumes about where we're going to be with social services. Um, well, I think, you know, recovering from a pandemic, you know, if we use that as an umbrella as well, is always going to be very, very demanding. Um, but I, I think the core things you say, you said in the in the introduction, the, 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 the points you, you went through, I think they apply equally. Um, and I think it's just keeping keeping the course you know putting the energy and the effort in um to achieving those strategic aims of good quality procurement to get good quality services never standing still always seeking to improve it i think they they resonate um still but i perhaps it's it's you know in in the context of what you've just said it's the understanding that we are recovering from a pandemic and that we need to, to to keep paying attention to this journey and not lose sight of these, you know, the, the core objectives all the councillors have mentioned. Um, I don't think it deviates from that. I just think it makes it extra challenging. And, you know, I, I, I yeah, I, I don't think I would change anything that we do, but we've just got to keep doing it and probably much harder. It's much more pressurised um, because of all the impacts that we're going through and still going through right now. So I just mentioned that if I may. OK, Mike, you've got your hand back up. Yes, I, thank you for letting me come back in again, Chair. Yeah, uh, on, on the education um, evidence that we had, uh, as I say, I did flat, I did raise, as I say, the issues with procurement and the, the amount of um, uh, percentage that was being flagged up with schools, not fully understanding how procurement, you know, the procedures and that. And I think we, I think that should, I think, Chair, that we should have that as a recommendation of, Plus, we ask schools to have a, 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 a sort of committee through the actual governing body to, uh, you know, sort of um, be, be involved in, in, in the setting because schools are, 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 are one, one of the biggest areas that, that will go out for, for work to be done. So, as I say, so well, if, if, if that could be pressed, put forward as one of the, one, one, one of the uh, actual recommendations that would, would be helpful, I, I, I would imagine. Okay. And, uh, and also, um, in, regard, uh, in regarding as well, if we could see if we could see if we can get more encouragement to uh, have uh, uh, more local businesses come on board with us, you know, to, to uh, apply for the work from the council. I think I th think that 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 would send a, a very good message as well. Okay, uh, Chris. Yeah, I was going to um, add to Councillor White's point of with. I mean, just to I, I agree with what you're saying. I think there's you know again in that wider picture, there's still um, support and focus needs to be um, placed on procurement activity. So I don't disagree with what you said at all. I was going to say that um, two things one with the education spend a, a lot if we're looking at school upgrades for example for, for the buildings and so forth the vast majority of that goes through the council's education directorate who then will work with somebody like corporate building services to put in place um, the right contractual arrangements you know so we have so it, it doesn't go direct to schools I guess is the point I'm making we have a um, a huge amount of coverage through the existing council mechanisms so that the relative percentage that goes through schools is relatively small however i think you're right in saying yeah it's part of the the big picture you know you've mentioned previously issues have come up with it um 
and it's something we want to focus on and continue providing that support. So I'm not going to disagree with what you said. I just think I just place it in that wider context of um, the, the, the way the council supports schools. There's a lot of support in place, um, whether it's for IT purchases or, as I said, f the fabric of buildings and, and so forth. I just thought I'd mention that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, Peter, Councillor Peter Jones. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, um, well, my points are in relation to what we call green and ethical matters uh, in the course of the report. And first of all, I noticed paragraph 3.2, which says investigate whether green and ethical matters should and can be included in the audit process. Um, I wonder whether I, I would like to see that expressed more strongly. Um, I appreciate that there is a, an issue for consideration. Um, but I think it would be very disappointing, to put it mildly, if, quote, green and ethical matters could not be included in, in, future, in the future audit process. I mean, we've always understood audit, of course, and we had this discussion back in July. We've always understood audit in terms of financial probity and so forth. Um, but you know, given the world we're in now, given COP26, given COP15, given where we're headed, I would hope that part of the procurement process and the auditing of the procurement process would give strong attention to ensuring that we as a council are addressing green and ethical matters uh, in terms of the procurement process. And then the other, also in relation to that, moving back to paragraph 2.7, which of course is about building upon an embedding environmental and ethical practice. Um, questions are asked there, um, which clearly need to be answered in the report, and uh, I'm sure will be. I'm sure Michelle is nodding. Um, you know, do we feel we had a clear vision, aims, and objectives? Uh, I hope we do. You know, we've got a corporate, uh, we've got a, a corporate plan with a, a clear well-being objective for natural resources and biodiversity. So one would expect to see that represented in. Um, uh, procurement practices and of course are we considering future generations well of course legally we're now required to do so uh, under the well-being and future generations act and of course impact on climate change well again we've now both had a climate climate emergency motion uh, passed by council a climate action plan developing and of course we've recently also uh, approved a nature emergency motion in full council and again therefore all of these are policy commitments that I think have to be reflected and expressed in our procurement process so those are my views Chris thank you okay th thank you very much Peter I think what you're saying is actually perfectly right you know we do need to have that um we do need to have that embedded in the process in in the procurement process um and i think that's um i think what michelle is saying that that will actually be part and parcel of the final report um uh, anyone else david uh councillor david hopkin would do, do you wish to add anything no it's uh, particularly on peter's point i just want to add it <clears throat> The, the, yes, I know we've only recently uh, passed that notice of motion, and, and I totally support that. And I think it, it, there is a lot to be done, uh, but, but there's a commitment to make sure they do happen, uh, that, that, that it is the right thing to do. And so I, I personally will give assurances that we will work closely to, to ensure that, that we do meet all these challenges going forward. It is difficult. Um, I mean, no, no thing on that, but um, there is certainly a commitment for myself to ensure that that not only green, but, but localism is, is, is prioritised as, as much as we possibly can going forward. But um, I would like to put my on, my on record, my thanks to yourself, uh, particularly for the way that you do try to uh, put, put the green agenda at the top. And uh, it's, thank you for that, Peter. OK, Councillor Jeff Jones. Yeah, the, you know, the further point, 3.6, actually build upon ways to increase local social procurement. I don't know if that could be expanded to actually actually say that uh, whites ensuring that um, all processes are actually lawful and ethical. Um, I, I again go, you know, I, I know I'm not, I'm not against local suppliers, but I think we must ensure really that it's an even playing field for anybody to 
actually participate. Um, I don't expect somebody from Rotherham to actually uh, come down and stick a few doors on and so on, but I, I would expect really that, uh, shall we say, larger procurement exercises, uh, in, you know, are an even playing field for everybody to participate. The, the big problem with large contracts like the arena is that locally we haven't got companies any longer like Rocod. Rocod were a manufacturing uh, steel business that would put be a, would have been able to do the framework for the arena, but they went bust. And now that is the problem in South Wales. And as much as we like to think that we could keep large contracts locally, you know, and go back to the the, the, the days of the the big oil refineries in 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 um, Milford Haven, you know, there were so they were large manufacturing large engineering companies in the area that were servicing them fortunately they've all gone uh, and we are we now have to unfortunately go to other parts of the country and parts of europe to actually get um the the expertise necessary to do that um which 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 i i fully agree you know what i mean that's what i'm saying we must ensure that it's a it's an open uh, you know playing field and so on um again i know we went through uh, it was brought up uh, perhaps i brought it up with regard to perhaps fragmenting contracts perhaps to ensure that um local suppliers could actually uh, participate you know whereas perhaps they couldn't if the contract was kept as one and so on it's just really an, an assurance really that we uh, you know follow procurement rules and shall we say that uh, it's a it's a it's a level playing field for everybody i think one of the things that we've done and i think chris and will, will be able to confirm this we have had events where we ask major contractors to have uh, an open day for companies locally to go in and pitch for some work saying what their expertise is and what have you. So I think we have had that. I mean, the, the problems, I go back to the problem I have, a lot of the expertise that we used to have is now gone. Um, you know, I, I know of one or two firms that used to do very professional tiling for swimming pools and that type of thing. Well, when we done the leisure centre, they had gone. Uh, you know, we we had to get a firm in from, I think it was Bristol or whatever, <clears throat> because the local firms had actually gone bust. Um, so I think in that respect, you know, when we have these events for major contractors to have meet meet the buyer for the want of a better term or meet the contractor, we should carry on doing that on all our projects. Um, okay, Jeff, uh, Councillor Mary Sherwood, I. And, uh, yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, this is this is my favourite issue in our discussions, isn't it? <laughs> um, I I think I have to say I think uh, Jeff's concerns are are misplaced. I, I, you know, I think I think if anything, the statutory procurement rules that we've been working to for decades and decades have emphasised this level playing field. You know, historically, not just. Uh, within the UK, but even within the whole EU. And what's more of a challenge is to embrace the permissions we have in the Social Value Act and the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and the changes that we're more recently seeing to actually finally be allowed to give more priority to local contractors. And I think that actually bending with that and being creative with that is the more pressing challenge than making sure we have a level playing field. I think that's that's been the, the procurement standard since day one. So I think what's more of a challenge for us now that we need to rise to is seeing how we can let go of that insistence on being open to business from anywhere and instead justify giving priority to, to business locally. I am absolutely yeah, I share your concerns absolutely about local businesses simply not being there, the local provision, you know, but this is where procurement needs to connect up with economic development. So what I'm, what I would like to raise is the fact that, you know, in, in Preston, they didn't, they didn't just give up and shrug and go and uh, procure from elsewhere when they couldn't get what they needed within the region. They, they started economic development projects to get those businesses running 
so that they could supply the local public sector with what they needed. And I think that might be a bit of a missing piece here. Um, and that going forward, what would be a good idea is for Welsh local authorities to communicate more with each other and with Welsh government about the gaps that are coming up, about like where is the public sector unable to find decent quality supply from here within Wales? And how can that inform Welsh government and local authority investment in economic development activities to create those supply chains and help us keep our money circulating in our own nation? Thanks. I, I I tend to I, I do agree with you, Mary. Um, uh, that there is that element to it, I, and I think that that's fine when you come down to a certain level. And I think I totally agree with that. But we've always been able to to work more beyond bricks and mortar. We've always been able to put social elements in to all our contracts. And I think one of the things that we need to do is to use that social element in a way in which <clears throat> it doesn't just apply to certain projects like when you build a when we build a school the social contract means that they um the beyond bricks and mortar they have to apply apprentices they have to do other things like that the problem is it's the supply chain that comes behind that that's what you're saying about brick making and what have you so i think those elements of it are that's a fair comment and i think it's a matter of scoping to find out what we got and what we haven't got and to what we've got is then use that scoping exercise to say this is what we've got in our local community, this is what we have in Swansea, this is what we have in Wales, and um, can you buy off these? I think that's the exercise that needs to be done to ensure that that happens, Mary. Okay, Councillor, oh sorry, Chris, Chris, Chris Williams. Thanks, I was just going to mention in terms of that general link, so the Beyond Bricks and Mortar team do sit in our um, economic directorate, they will come to us and look at all the future contracts for which we are seeking tenders, and they will take a view on all of the sort of contract pipeline as to where that work, um, where that work may be best integrated um, in terms of that agenda. So I just wanted to say we do have that link. Um, at a, a kind of local level, I, I can quite understand what what is being said in you know in terms of the larger picture. Um, but I just wanted to emphasise that we do already have that internal link, and we are looking at this, um, you know, it, it, as we work through our sort of contracts pipeline. Thanks. Okay, so um, has anybody anything else to say before we talk? Go back to Michelle, and I ask Michelle to go, roughly go through what we have in the findings report, <coughs> excuse me, in the findings report, and then we we will actually put together a report, send it out to all members, and I'll ask Chris to comment on it as well, and David, obviously, um, and ask them to comment on it, and then <coughs> we will have a, finance, a, fi a final report that we need to present to Cabinet and to Council. Uh, Michelle, would you like to go through the basic, what we've, what we've already, the work we we've, we've done i think we're all very happy with what we the the, the with the evidence that we've received um so i think if you, if you can go through um some of the findings that we've already discovered in that uh yeah let me just uh, probably the best thing to do would be to to share the screen with the report and then i can just go through some of the things we've got here uh the moment i'll just find my report here it will let me do it. Da, 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 da. Can you see it? Yeah. No, lovely. There we are. So, um, I mean, the basic, the, the covering report really, um, initially I uh, was just put together to, to give you prompts, um, which you've done today. Um, but some of the findings that that um, that I've I've been going through going through all the findings in depth and, and um, starting to pull out some of those. But um, so we're still in early stages at the moment. So uh, obviously today was about you pulling out what you think are key as well. But um, some of the things we've got is ensuring um, alignment is built into the council's recovery plan and clearly aligned to council objectives. Well, I think it clearly um, from the evidence you've gathered that that's clearly in place. You know, there it's it's. Um, written in the recovery plan, in the council's recovery plan, and 
uh, all the council's um, procurement activities are, are based on service plans within departments which link closely to the council objectives. So that's that's clearly um, uh, in place. And again, um, as we were saying today, it's all very legislative. So with point 2.2, it's, um, you know, the process is very, very legislative. Um, so we, you know, I think it's very clear that we're following those those, those legislative frameworks and that staff are being trained. Um, there was um, a suggestion by, I think it, um, I think it was place directorate that um, that we have more training in some areas, um, especially on any new changes, etc. But apart from that, that, you know, um, I think it's quite a positive thing. The only thing in, within this one was where I think uh, Councillor Peter Jones mentioned um, about um, uh, the impact, measuring impacts of, um, he was talking about the environmental stuff and the um, climate change, but I think that also relates to the localism and ethical stuff as well. So I was going to put something within the report relating to that. Um, I've got ensure council contracts the quality. Um, uh, you know, I I believe that the the processes you've got in place, we've got in place as a council through the you know the evidence you've gathered does do that. Um, I think we've got European Union. There was obviously. Um, uh, a number of different um, effects of the European Union uh, leaving the European Union, but I think members um, members also heard that it's not only Brexit, but also the pandemic itself, and um, and also the sheer amount of um, activity that's taking place in relation to building materials, etc. As well, was another thing. Um, so that that's a relatively small section really so that will detail your thoughts i mean i don't know if you've got any conclusions you want to make on that um it's very difficult isn't it i mean we can state what what actually the, the current situation is but i'm not sure we can actually say um what can be done about it at this point you know because it's, it's still we're still in the middle of it aren't we yeah i don't think there's anything we can say about 2.4 because it's going to be very difficult, I think, in, to quantify that at the moment until we got more evidence. Um, if I can go back for a minute, can you go back to 2.1? Yeah. If any members have got anything they want to say about as we go through, can you please indicate? On 2.1, ensuring procurement is built into the Council's recovery plan and key objectives moving forward. I think one of the things we need to do there is to make members make members and employees aware of what um, the recovery plan is and what the objectives are because i'm not absolutely sure that we are aware or what people are aware of what that means and that and i i think i got if peter's got his hand up but i have a feeling if he would like to put something in there about um ensuring a sustainable recovery peter Yes, Chris, thank you. Yes, I would want to uh, insert that important word uh, sustainable there. That wasn't uh, actually what I wanted to comment on. Um, I really wanted to move on to the, the, the Brexit item 2.4. OK, we'll come on to that. I think then. there is something that we can say there, and it's picking up really on what Councillor Mary Sherwood was saying in her remarks a little earlier. Uh, and that is, I mean, I'm a Remainer. I voted very strongly and campaigned, in fact, to keep the UK in the European Union. But we are where we are. Um, and the question really is, how can we use having left the European Union to affect our procurement practices? And I think picking up on what I think Mary was saying is that leaving the European Union has freed us from some of the constraints that perhaps membership of the European Union imp imposed upon uh, procurement and that maybe we can now indeed procure, uh, follow a more independent control approach uh, to procurement than might have been the case had we stayed in the European Union. So we maybe want to make some comment along those lines. Thank you. Okay, but I say on, on 2.1, ensure procurement building the account is recovery plan and is sustainable and clear, you know, and clearly defined within them. OK, can we then move on to 2.2? I think we all agree with 2.2. It's got to ensure that it's within the uh, legal frameworks of the of both Council, West, uh, Welsh Government and UK Government. Uh, 2.3, I think 
going on considering how we, uh, sorry, 2.3 inch the council quality is as well as value for money as his contract order to get better strong. I think we can pr we can act positively say that uh, the current procurement rules and the way in which we operate does get best value. Um, and I think that I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, has anybody got any comments on that? No, OK. Um, and 2.4, what you were just mentioning, Peter, and what, what Councillor Sherwood said, Mary said, um, considering the evening it will affect the procurement of Swansea. I think, I think the only thing I would add to that would be, um, given where we currently are um, within, within um, uh, our trading partners, if you like, for the want of a better term, that we ensure that we get the best the, um, the best deals for the public of Swansea, regardless of whether we're in or out of the EU. OK, Mary. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I think I think really the point is that when we were when when you're in a common market, the prosperity of the overall market benefits you, doesn't it? So, yeah. you know, when we with within the EU, it doesn't really matter if we're supporting a Welsh business, an English business, a French business, a German business, because everybody everybody is benefiting from the collective being more prosperous and being able to trade easily. But when you sh when you shrink that in, when you're not when you're no longer part of that collaborative. You've got to think more just about prosperity as an individual nation. So, you know, I, I, I do agree with Peter. I'm also a Remainer and just, you know, but but that's why you know, I, I thought that it would be better to be part of a bigger collective all supporting each other through an open market. Yep. If we no longer have that, we've got to try and prioritise keeping money within our own borders. So, I mean, the idea of value should extend to what are we left with in liquid cash terms as a country, you know? So if we are having to buy business in from far away, you know, what are we, what are we being, we're getting a service or we're getting a product, but our money has gone. So, you know, I think priority being given to procuring within Wales sits with our kind of strategy for coping with having left the EU. I think we can put some words in together like that. Uh, thanks, Mary. Councillor Jeff Jones. Yeah, perhaps you know I need some clarity. I I certainly was remain there as well. You know, uh, uh, when I talk about an open playing field, yes, it was in the the common market. No, we've actually left the common market. Um, I, well, perhaps I need updating on the legislation here, but I thought we were part of the UK. Not Wales, you know. Chris, can can you clarify with regards to? I know they they're going to bring out new uh, procurement rules shortly. That's right. Does that relate to the UK or is it just to Wales? It relates to the UK. Yeah, the Welsh government has decided to follow the UK government's um, framework. We don't know what the detail of that is. Um, what I do know, I think, is that Scotland won't be following the UK government's rules. They're going to create their own legislative framework. So effectively, they're UK rules, but they're going to be for England, Wales and Northern Ireland, as far as I'm um, understood. Um, to complicate it a little bit more, if I may, whilst we've left the European Union, we have, in fact, joined another trading bloc, the World Trade Organization. And that also has requirements which are pretty similar, you know, probably not strangely, to the European Union ones that above a certain threshold you openly advertise. So the impact of that is yet to be determined, um, but there is still this obligation that will, um, and, and which is why the current laws haven't changed yet, there is still this obligation to openly tender um, above certain um, thresholds, which are fairly low. You know, cumulatively, one hundred and eighty thousand um, pounds is about the threshold for goods and services. Um, I think that actually drops with the WTO rules as well. So it's fundamentally we are where we are. we're still where we were pre EU at the moment. We're still operating on the same rule base. There will be some changes which probably won't be as radical as as perhaps um, some people hope. However, 
linking back to some of the points that have been made on the social value agenda and integrating more weighting for that. Um, they are looking at that at the UK stroke Wales level to provide more leadership and clarity on that as to specify exactly what's possible. So it should open up some more opportunities um, on that front. Um, like I say, it's a bit difficult to comment yet because we've not seen the detailed paper. All I know is those are issues that they are looking at. Um, and we would hope I would hope I think we discussed this at a previous meeting. We'd hope to have had that paperwork by now, but we haven't had it yet. And likely implementation of a new law is not probably going to be till 2023, 24. Um, so a couple of years away yet. So we're, we're a bit in advance of that clarity. Hope that helps. Yeah, I, I, I know we'll, WTO World Trade World Trade Organization rules are incredibly complex and they cover everything from bananas to battleships. You know, it, it's ridiculous what it is. But you know, I I wasn't aware that you know that we we were going to have it was going to affect that low evaluation of trade of that of procurement but there we are so what we'll have to put something in there but i i suspect that we you know the, the how the effect on leaving the union the eu um should be we, we should add something in there to say that we you know we look to get the best deal for the people of swansea and as best we can and keep as much as uh, the swansea pound in the swansea yeah. area yeah, oh, exactly. that nature. I think that that's about the best we can actually say on that one. Well, OK, keep within the rules, yeah. Hmm? Well, keeping within the rules, the current. Well, yeah, we got to do that. We, we said that earlier on, Jeff, we've got to keep within the law. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> I don't see want to see a visit Cress in prison. <laughs> OK, can we move on? Um, right, I think we've already mentioned 2.5 about the social um benefits uh, which we've had for a long time but we can reinforce um the contact and meeting the general equality duty i think we i think that's a difficult one i think we we've um we've actually done that but um what what's what do you think michelle yeah we clearly do meet the the uh general equalities act you know the uh the uh, equalities duties that are uh, public sector uh ones really um through the processes we have in place quite strong processes we have in place really and um the iias um are part of that um so i think that is another one that's really quite legislative as well um i suppose it's about i think it's about whether um you feel that that should be taken further um in in Swansea or you know or if we do more than than we actually than we actually need to legally I don't know I, I don't think we do more than what <clears throat> what we legally allowed to do I think we are we had, we do do everything according to the Equalities Act I think the big problem of that is um is embedding it a right to cross the organization and I think that's one thing we should say to ensure equality is equal for everyone across the whole organization <clears throat> yeah uh, comments from members no okay um right environmental and ethical practices well i think you know we got to actually put that in but i think taking what peter's point is perhaps we should put more um building on embedment but we should consider the <clears throat> sustainability of everything that we do. Peter? Well, yes, I have nothing really to add to what I said earlier in the uh, discussion. Sustainability is the key issue um, in this area. I mean, the final question is, how do you feel we can improve in this area? Um, I don't know what goes into the wording of uh, when, when, when we're commissioning contracts but i guess we will if we don't already then we should be putting into the commissioning document a clear statement of the council's environmental and ethical standards and requirements so that anyone uh, seeking to seeking to work for the council is quite clear the conditions that they would have to meet and show that they were able and intending to meet them thank you i think that's a fair comment okay 
uh, 2.8, considering our joint procurement activities and how they work with others. I think that that's what we put down there. Um, I think that's about all we can actually say yet. And, and one remem one thing you have to remember <clears throat> that from uh, May of next year, we have uh, joint committees for various uh, aspects of council business, including planning. Um, so I think we need to be what we've got down there is what we can say currently. We have to be mindful of uh, what's happening in the future with the um, these joint committees being formed. OK. Um, and then what's the next one then? Making sure we monitor and measure success and continue to improve. I think that goes without saying, does it not? Uh, is everybody happy with that? Yeah. Right, OK, and then uh, item three. Uh, these, Chris, are um, these are the all the things that have come out so far from your notes yeah. and also things that were suggested in the different meetings we had. I mean, obviously they overflow from each other um, and they're just some ideas of, of recommendation. You've talked about a lot of them, actually. Um, but some of the things that come out of place um, that, that uh, Martin Nichols actually mentioned that would be quite useful, um, things like expand the number of open days. I mean, it all, it's all down to um, resource, isn't it, as well? But yeah. um, expand the number of open days, um, increase the level of training for new starters, make sure we have updates on new policy document, documentation and that sort of thing. But um, they're, they're, uh, some of them are recommendations and some are just more like statements, really. But whether mm. you feel that any of those would be relevant to to be included in the report. Um, but I can always go through those with you, Chris, anyway, when we're doing okay. the final report and what we think is appropriate to, to the, the conclusions that are made, really. OK. Um. I don't know who that is, but Mike, you've got your yeah. hand up. Yes, yes, thank you, Chair. Just a little minor point, really, on, on the report. On, on, on the report, um, we've got two, uh, two, two items of two point eight. Um, just a little thing. To, uh, oh yes, yeah. Yeah, perhaps we put the second. Oh yeah. Line. It's only just something little, but uh, just in case you know, there's any sort of uh, any thing gets flagged up within those areas that we're looking at. Yeah. Okay. I know. Thank you, Mike, for that. Right, then I think uh, going through each one of the very briefly going through the the various um, places, I think the one from place where Martin suggests a bit more training and expanding open days, is, I think that would seem, I think would be uh, quite important for that to be added. Um, give sufficient weight to biodiversity and natural environment, that has to be added as well. Um, if we then go down on to social services, I think social services, as I was saying to, to Chris earlier on in the narrative, um, because of it is a difficult one, uh, but I think what we said, the first to develop a robust detailed set of contract pursuit and rules, and I think that's adequate. Chris, do you think that's adequate? Uh, sorry, I'll just have a quick look through this again. So we look at 3.13 particularly. Yeah, uh, social services. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this came from their report to the panel, didn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it all sounds fair to, to me. Yeah, I don't have any. Um, I mean, I think with with our recommendations, obviously, the things you're going to put into you, I mean, you could put these in the conclusions section in the recommendations. Obviously, they need to be actionable things with, yeah. you know, so so, you know, um, uh, the recommendations we put need to be able to see an action at the end of it, really, and a time scale within that. So obviously some of these things may just go in your in, in the conclusions rather than the recommendations um, sort of be mentioned as something that was raised. Um, so I think 3.14 got commissioning teams uh, within the director are not created and resourced to procure in a way. I mean, I, the statement's there, but it doesn't give any um, indication as to how that could be done and whether it needs to be done urgently and, and you know, whether the panel would need to um, put a recommendation within that or it's, it's yeah, a little bit vague, yeah. that one. On the commissioning reviews, I've, I've sat on most of the commissioning reviews 
and what they say in there about the social services that's been going on for a number of years and i and i think that what we will be put what we should be put in there is <clears throat> commission into teams with a directive uh, would not create it or resource to pre uh, proceed in a way that is currently required. I think that's a fair comment, actually, and I think we should use that as a recommendation that it should be saying that it should be seriously considered about how the commissioning teams are set up in future yeah. and how they're operated, because the, the, the in the past, um, I gave you a, a very, very brief um, example, is when we asked for prices for um, how much it costs for people to stay in our residential homes and how much it costs to stay in residential homes in the private sector. The the, the figures were nonsensical, if I'm honest, uh, and that applies to um, uh, there's a, 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 quite a number of services within social services. So I think that's very important that we put commissioning teams within the directive with not should be created to be and resourced to give best value for the, the clients and the council. Mm. And I think we should put it in the way that it should be clients and council, as opposed to council and clients. OK. Um, yeah. And then the corporate centre, uh, this, this one is again, given that that uh, can you move the Michelle can you move it oh, yeah it, uh, in the corporate center if you remember the discussion we had with Adam basically it's it's more about what is the corporate center and if the um, recommendations are currently going before council by the chief executive that corporate center could change again mm. so anything that we put in there um, I think it's just what's in the first paragraph. I'm not sure we could in, put anything else in. What, what, what members' views? No. Nope. Okay. Then we'll move on. What's the next one? Education is the next one. Is it? <clears throat> I think again. It's going back to what Mike, Councillor Mike White said earlier on about uh, making sure the schools are, uh, you know, properly informed of what our procurement rules are, and uh, <clears throat> we we continue to to actually help the schools in their in their procurement exercises, uh, but also um, we understand what uh, the devolved budgets to schools means as well, and I think that's another issue that. Many people don't understand that we devolve budgets to schools and schools have a responsibility to spend that money wisely. In um, 99% of the time they do. Um, good governors and what have you make sure of that. So I, I think basically the, the, the first paragraph, has everybody agreed with that? OK, and the second half about um, carbon miles, if I'm honest, I think that's important as well. And then it's move, move on, Michelle. Uh, yeah, That's we'll just um, then it's just that the, the actual all your evidence you've gathered, and I'll just whip through. I won't go through that, but I'll just whip through the, the early parts. Really, is just the it's basically um, your terms of reference, which the questions that we've been looking at um, were based around those. Um, so that you've gone through those. Um, so the report itself will be based around your terms of reference, your original terms of reference, answering those key questions. Um, so we're and and forming recommendations based on that. So um, myself and Councillor Holly will put that together and bring it to you on the 31st of January um, in an informal meeting for you to chew over and discuss before we have a formal meeting on the 21st of February. Um, it's just your timetable, so that evidence is what you've, the work you've actually done. Um, your uh, integrated impact assessment on the inquiry, um, which we had to do early on, so we pop that in there to evidence that was done. Your call for evidence. Um, we had a call. We, we didn't really have any response, though. We did put it out on the blog. We tweeted it. We also put it on the council section around um, consultation. But um, I think because this subject is quite an internal subject, really, isn't it? For it's not a generally sort of 
public public subject that maybe yeah. you know we didn't get any interest we did have one um question didn't we which which um dave howes answered on that um this is some of the um information that you've had as background evidence then some of it also is weaved through through the actual reports you've had as well and then it just goes through the actual evidence that that um that you had really i suppose the only thing i want to point to obviously there's all the you know i'll go through all these um um your discussions and pull out the key points from those as well as as your conclusions but also um there's um there's this section where you spoke to people on um you spoke to the contractors really as well which mm. is quite useful and there's a lot of quotes and things within that which will need to be fed through as well so that's really it unless you want me to go any through any more with the, the final the um, draft report but um I, don't, I think I, that's I, this is just basically a gathering of all your evidence really in one place okay um Obviously, members, if if there's any comments you want to make now, or do you want to wait until myself and Michelle have, have put together the interim reports, which will be sent out, and then ask for comments from you on on what's in it, and if you want to correct any of the faults that we've made or add anything to it, I will also send it to Councillor David Hopkin and um, <coughs> excuse me for his view as well. Um, is there any other? questions or comments uh chris i was just going to make a note that and i understand the formula that's been adopted to extract the evidence um for the report i was just going to say looking at something like social services we've put a huge amount of effort in um to support with their the, the re-procurement of um some of their existing you know, services which last many years and how their shape and how the innovation i, I was just thinking we, there's probably need to put some of the context that's in their report as well to yeah. show a journey it, it, because i think yeah i can understand why we've extracted the sort of core bits but i think it's important as well for all the officers involved to show recognition of a journey recognition of hard work and effort um and, and just to provide that wider uh, picture if that's okay that'd be my suggestion no, that's not a problem. And I suppose, right. if I may as well, you, you mentioned the interest from the public, you know, the public interest in the inquiry. I think if we had been operating in a way that was biased, if we had been operating in a way that was poor practice, I think you would have had people knocking down the doors <laughs> to, to complain, you know. And and I think personally, I think it is a sign that they, people do think we're doing the best that we can. I'm never going to say that we can't improve, we can't learn, but I think people perceive us as doing a decent job, that we are providing that openness, that transparency, and I think that's what the external community wants. But, I, you know, I'd always say there's room for improvement, but I, I think that's part of the picture, just to mention that in terms of that uh, external interest that, uh, uh, for this inquiry. Okay, Councillor Mike White. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, in regards to social services, yes, and clearly we've got to consider as well, because of the pandemic, social services were right at the hub of things and, and they basically yeah, just had to go in and hit, hit the ground run in, you know, especially with issues for PPE and things like that, you know. So, you know, I think there's there's quite a lot that's been achieved there and I, and I think, that, and, I, I, and I certainly think that there's, that there's obviously good practice there as well, you know, so I'd just like to add that. We we will put in something about that, but I, um, we certainly got better practices than the central government in Westminster anyway, that's a definite, um, um, you know, because of the way in which our procurement has worked out. And taking Chris's point about um, if we were doing things wrong, people would knock on our door. Um, people do knock on our door, Chris. It's just that sometimes, you know, you it's the it's the quantity of the people that knock on your door. That's the difference, isn't it? You know, you're never going to please everyone, and that, and that, and that. But as long as you're honest with people, that's the most important thing. As long as you tell them why they didn't get a particular job, they may not like it. But if you're honest with them, then they'll come back again. If you're dishonest, is where they don't come back, and that, and that's part of the problem. And one of the problems we had for many years, and I, there may be some councillors who don't know about this, but many many years ago we had the 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 system by which we were to pull off contractors from lists, and sometimes those lists were distorted, shall we say, 
uh, and but now there's a little bit more openness and we've had that for over 20 years now which has made a big difference a big difference okay if that if that's all um oh lyndon did you did you did you put your hand up lyndon no oh it's david david Councillor david hawken yeah, thanks, Chair. Before we finish, could, could I just uh, thank everybody in the meeting for the way professionally that this is, the inquiry plan has been carried out. And I would like to put my, my thanks uh, to, to Michelle as well, the way that, that it's certainly been a very informative um, uh, panel. And I, I know the journey is, if we're on that journey, we're still, we're still a lot to do. But I think we, we are a changing authority. And we're, I, one thing I don't think we do enough of is singing what we do well, and I think that's something perhaps that we need. We do need to look at. But I just want to say thank you very much to to, to the professional way this panel have, uh, have operated throughout. Thank you very much, David. And um, I think when I make the final report to cabinet, I think it's the cabinet anyway. I hope it is. Um, I will be mentioning that as well. That I think our procurement exercise has gone from strength to strength and I and I think we now can hold our head up high and say we're one of the best, if not the best in you know in the area, but I think we one of the best in Wales. Councillor Peter Jones. Yeah, sorry quickly, Chair. I just want to thank Michelle in particular. She's done a tremendous job. When you look at the papers, nearly three hundred pages of evidence that uh, over the months she's put together in a, a comprehensive and efficient manner. Um, and along with the other officers, of course, and David and Chris and so forth. But I think, Michelle, you deserve a special congratulation for the way that you conducted this inquiry, its fullness, its comprehensiveness, and its thoroughness. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. You'll be getting a box of chocolates off here, Michelle, for Christmas. Oh, hello. Thank you so much. I just wanted to echo um, Peter's um, thanks to Michelle. Absolutely marvellous. And also Peter's, I've got to say, Peter, I'm part of the Environmental um, Scrutiny Board. And Peter has been absolutely fantastic. And by putting the um, environment in the forefront, absolutely fabulous. But just thank you all. We're all working towards making a better Swansea. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, on that, I don't think anybody can better that. So if that's the case, <laughs> can I can I thank you all for attendance? And um, I'll see you soon. Uh, Michelle, do you want to stay on the line of mine? I'll stop recording.